Good afternoon. We want to try to get started because we are being uh, broadcast on our YouTube channel. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Elsie Scott. I am the director of the Ron Walters Leadership and Public Policy Center, the sponsor of this program today. This is our fourth year that we've had uh, a lecture series, but we decided to do something different this year. Uh, and instead of having an outside person come and lecture, we decided to have some of our brilliant students here at Howard University be our speakers today. And so uh, we sponsored a paper competition, and you'll meet the two winners in a few minutes. But before, before we get started to that, I just want to acknowledge the fact that Mrs. Patricia Walters, who is the chair of our board is here with us, as she always is. And you will hear from her later. She's the widow of uh, Dr. Walters. And I also want to recognize we have uh, two sons of Edgar Kimler, who taught at Howard University many years ago. And they are the sponsors of this program. And they've been sponsoring us for quite a few years now. And you'll hear from them after, after we have our And then we're also fortunate to have Stacey Abrams, and you'll hear from her in a few minutes. So again, trying to let the next generation take over, I'm going to sit down and introduce Elon Watson, who is my student assistant. I, uh, when I interviewed for this position of student assistant back the first semester, last semester, and it was just something about her that struck me. And I have not been dissatisfied with my choice. So she has taken this project and has run with it. She is originally from Ohio. Now her family's are relocated. Well, was your father was originally from North Carolina? Yeah, to North Carolina. So she will be uh, running the program today. So, you know. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us again today at our Empowering the Future student panel discussion. Like uh, Dr. Scott said, I am Elon Watson. I am a graduating senior political science major, legal communications minor from Columbus, Ohio. Um, to begin, <laughs> thank you. To begin today, I would love to introduce the students that won the competition. So, our first place winner, uh, Weslyn Harmon, is a senior political science major from Minneapolis, Minnesota. She is a first generation college student and credits her Liberian family and heritage for some of her success. She, curr she is currently serving as an intern with the National Science Foundation, providing management support for the development of the Regional Innovations Engines team in underserved areas. She is also a communications and media student intern with the Howard University Women, Gender, and Global Leadership Center. Our second place winner was Ellison Richardson. He is a junior, he is a junior honors political science, Afro-American studies, double major from Chicago, Illinois. As an, As an Eagle Scout, he has pursued service through the political system to focus all of his efforts towards racial, e racial equity through reparations for the black community. Through his internships with the White House, the Supreme Court of the United States, and Congress, he has refined his knowledge of the political system in spaces where we often do not have a single seat at the table. Ellison. I now would like to introduce our special guest who is going to be handing the students their certificates. 
Stacey Abrams is a political leader, business owner, and New York Times bestselling author. A tax attorney by training, Ab Abrams served 11 years in the Georgia House of Representatives, seven years as minority leader, and became the Democratic nominee for governor of Georgia in 2018 and 2022. Over the course of her career, she has launched multiple organizations devoted to democracy protection, voter, voter engagement, tackling social issues, and building a more equitable future in the South. Committed to the pursuit of equity, she works to break barriers for young people, people of color, and the marginalized through her work in the public, nonprofit, and corporate sectors. She currently serves as the Ronald W. Walters Endowed Chair for Race and Black Politics at Howard University and is a senior, count and is a senior counsel to Rewiring America. Abrams is also CEO of Sage Works Productions Incorporated, an entertainment production company. Abrams sits on both nonprofit and corporate boards, and she is a lifetime member of the Council on Foreign Relations. She has received degrees from Spelman College, the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas, and Yale Law School. Please welcome Ms. Stacey Abrams. Hello. <laughs> Hello, all. Thank you so much for such a generous introduction, Dr. Scott. It's always a pleasure. Mrs. Walters, thank you for uh, letting me have a reason to be here over and over again. And to the Kemmler family, thank you so much for your investment and these incredible young minds. It is my privilege and my pleasure to present these certificates. I'm going to start with our second place winner. Um, Ellison, no, don't get up yet. Okay. <laughs> uh, when we were uh, having a chat before this moment, uh, one of the four Kemlers, uh, I call them the Kemler Quad, um, <laughs> are very long, we've known each other for at least five minutes now, uh, asked about voting and how we engage and incentivize voting, how we respond to the national crisis that we have in our republic. And I gave an answer that come, that, you know, emerge from my experience, but what excites me about today is that having read your papers, having read your words, and thinking about how you are approaching these critical issues, Ellison, you demonstrate not only an understanding of what we face, but a capacity to help lead us towards solutions. And so it is my honor to present you with this award, the Ronald W. Walters Leadership and Public Policy Center Second Place Award, the 2024 Edgar Kemmler Lecture Series Paper Competition, on March 20th, 19, 2024. <laughs> and Westland. Westland decided to use the phrase lesser of two evils. And it is a brave thing in this moment when it is easy to say that things are too hard to fix when it is convenient to say it's not my problem, or when it is seen as falsely courageous to say I'm not going to engage, to have someone say we have to make a choice because the absence of engagement is actually the true evil. Wesleyan, your paper explicated conversations about not only what we face today, but it reminds us of how long we've been at this. And your Liberian heritage is I think emblematic of what we know to be true about the power of democracy and the power of the vote. A nation that was born of the idea that African Americans in particular could not find democracy here and instead went abroad. But you are proof that we can return to the spaces where we started these conversations and that we have the responsibility to engage in solutions. And so it is my honor to present the first place award for the 2024 Edgar Kimmler Lecture Series Paper Competition to Westland Harmon. And I'm going to take uh, the power of privilege of standing in front of a microphone to say a couple of additional things. Uh, I am honored to serve as the inaugural Ron Walters Chair this role is a bit protean in that instead of having a course that I teach weekly, I instead have the run of the place. I get to work with Dr. Scott and I get to wander the campus. And more importantly, I get to work with students across disciplines. 
Uh, my office sits in the social school of social work, which is critical because often the failures of our democracy are borne out by what we see in the area of social work. I am hosting a conversation tomorrow with students uh, led by the Hilltop, our students who understand that news and journalism are not dead, that we cannot change the future if we don't understand the present. And I will be hosting additional conversations across this campus with so many others working in cooperation and in concert with Dr. Scott, because we understand that preserving our democracy is not just a call to action, it is an existential crisis. But it's also an existential opportunity. We are living in a year that is unprecedented. There are 54, I believe it's 54, I could be wrong by one or two, uh, elections happening around the world right now, from Senegal to El Salvador, from what they pretended to do in Russia this week, to what we know will be hopefully happening in the US in November. We know that across the world, democracies are struggling for relevance. My commitment to democracy started as a young person. I sat on a quad much like the quad outside, only it's almost a little bit smaller, with a clipboard encouraging students to register to vote. I was 17, so I wasn't old enough to actually fill it out, and I will tell you almost no one stopped. Getting young people to pay attention to registration on a Friday afternoon was nearly impossible. But what I understood in that space was that someone had to be there. We had the responsibility to take action. And even if that action was asking someone to sign up to use the power of the vote, it was something I could do. Sign up to use the power of the vote, it was something I could do. It is my mantra wherever I go that we all have to, we have to release this idea that we have to get everything done everywhere all at once, that democracy delivers like magic. Instead, we have to hold to our obligation to do something somewhere soon. And in this year, at a time where conversations are happening here and abroad about the very nature of our humanity and the nature of our democracy and the story that we will tell to the next generation, it is my honor and my privilege to stand on a stage with three young people who are emblematic of why we are going to win. So thank you all so very much. Now, I'm gonna do one more thing that's slightly obnoxious, and that is hand out a copy of a book that I wrote a few years ago. Um, I was involved in this election in 2020. You may have heard something about it. And so <laughs> I wanted to write about democracy and the challenges we face. Uh, I didn't steal from either of you, I wrote it first. So when you read it, <laughs> just know that we are of like minds and hopefully of like intention. So thank you so very thank much. You. Okay, we wanna thank Ms. Abrams for taking time out of her busy schedule. She will be on campus two times tomorrow uh, tomorrow morning, and she'll be at WHUT in the morning uh, talking about women in politics. And there may be a few more slots available if uh, it's on the website, the Howard University website, and you'll see it. It's on women in politics. We have, I think we now have two congresswomen who will be here uh, Corey Bush from St. Louis and uh, Joyce Beatty from Ohio, so that will be tomorrow morning. But you need to register because it's in a television studio. We can only do 100, but we still had a few seats last night. Okay, I'm gonna turn the program back over to my sister. All right, so now we... Um, Mrs. Walters, you get to do whatever you want, so. <laughs> so let's uh, sit right about here. That's okay. And Kevin is very good with pictures. So do you want to? Okay. Thank you. 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 Professor, 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 Dr. Bill Nash. Oh, okay. 
Okay, so in a second I'm gonna have the two students they're gonna talk about um, why, they came, why did they decided to apply for the student paper competition and how they came up with their topic. But first I wanted to give a little bit of background. So Dr. Scott, after I first started working with her, asked me what topic that I thought that our generation would be interested in and excited about writing about. I came up with the 2024 election cycle because I realized that that was something that was very important to me. And as sentiment of all of my classmates around me, I felt that Howard students have a great voice and have a great opportunity to speak more about it. And I know that my classmates are very educated and they have great ideas and I wanted them to be excited to participate. And I'm so glad that we had so many people come out. But now I'm gonna turn over to the winners so they can talk about how they came up with the topic and why they decided to apply. Thank you, Elaine. Is it on? Can you hear me? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead. Say your name again, because some people came in later. Okay. Hello everyone, my name is Weslyn Harmon. I'm a senior political science major, business administration minor from Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I'll just read what I wrote um, just about my essay, just kind of general, um, I guess, summary of my essay, and then also like my journey to NCOPES over the weekend. Okay. I first had an interest in research when I was in high school, and this grew through undergrad. I've always used research to focus on analyzing the world around me. And for this essay in particular, I focus on the critical issues that would be most important to young members of the African diaspora in 2024 and throughout the presidential election. Whether, as a black, whether a black member of Generation Z chooses to vote or not, these issues identified will be the most important to them because they carry the highest impact in their own lives. Identified economic stability, overcome racial discrimination, healthcare access, and foreign relations as the issues many Generation Z voters are fighting to expand. I found that regardless of where young black voters fall on the political spectrum, these issues are the most important to them. And there continues to be a rise in awareness surrounding US foreign relations and the occupation of the Gaza Strip. Overall, this paper just showed me that the pivotal role that black voters of all age play is critical to any federal election and will continue to influence the country's direction, and digital communications will be an asset for the voting public. Attending the National Conference of Black Political Scientists this past weekend also demonstrated that I, that I could receive insight into the critical role of black political science re and research on issues that affect our community, and it's necessary to inform policy decisions and foster equitable discourse. Thank you guys again for being here. Hello? Okay. Excuse me. Okay. Am I audible? Yeah. Perfect. So hello everybody. Again, my name is Ellison Richardson, and it's an honor to sit in front of you all today. I titled my paper, The Bit of Necessity of Voting for the Lesser Evil. And while I do understand that this terminology may be strong, I believe that for my generation, it is absolutely necessary. Since maybe we were 10 years old, we have grown up and seen certain atrocities in this nation, and seen how they have persisted, seen how they have manifested, and seen how they have had no solution. And so, even with that being the case, I, write my, I wrote my paper with ideas of pragmatism and radicalism in mind. Because in order for our generation to truly see a solution and for this nation to truly progress, we must have a plan. Because, as Stacey Abrams said, our time is now. And so I wrote vehemently about how, while it is to some, it may be true that the current sitting president is the lesser evil, in the current day, sadly, it is all we have. And so in my paper, I advocate for how certain solutions are available to us in my generation, such as not just showing up on voting day. We have to do more. We have to show up more because we're at such a disadvantage not only are we younger, but if we, get, if we want to have our representatives to truly represent us in the issues that matter to us, we have to mobilize the moment the polls close because of that disadvantage. And these are feasible, it happened. I talked about my paper, how Stacey Abrams did it. And while it did take time, it was successful. And not just that by, I analyzed the, um, not just theory, excuse me, but statistics as well, showing proof that the current president is not well favored and why he is not. 
such as certain issues as detailed earlier about the current genocide going on in Palestine, about his age, about the lack of, I guess, success in certain issues as well, and certain things being codified. And so in my paper, I analyze each and every issue and how they can be fixed and why they must do so, why they can be fixed, why they should be fixed if we are to progress. Because at the end of the day, that's what I'm about. It's about reaching a better world. It's about progress. It's about getting somewhere where we don't have to choose between candidates that we may not want, yet that are our only choice. And so, that's what we need to do. That's what we can get. And it's feasible. It's all pragmatic. And in order to be pragmatic and be efficient, we also need to be radical in doing so. So the main bulk of today is we wanted to give audience members and anybody who wanted to ask our students a question any, about their papers or about any current issues. We also have some questions if you guys are still thinking of some, but I wanted to open up to the audience if you guys have any questions you would like to begin with. So this is a question for the panelists on the right. My voice is like really loud now. Um, so my question is, you use the term radicalism in terms of getting people out to vote. I wanted to know what did that look like? And then what did that look like for you? You know, what is, what is radical, I guess, voter registration look like? Like, what does that look like? And then also, um, if that is a framework that you're using in terms of getting people to the polls, how do you do that across age, gender, race, class? Um, and are you thinking of the population as a whole, as a, like us as Americans, our entire country? Or do you have like analysis like Wesleyan that's talking about the African diaspora? But what does that look like for you? And then how do we, what would that look like in terms of implementation? Right. Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. To address the first one in terms of radical, I guess, voting efforts, I would see that as putting the politicians that we believe to be radical in terms of progressing us to the forefront and doing so we have to have a pragmatic plan. It's not just about showing up and then voting for them and hoping that's, that they get in. It's about mobilizing. It's about advocating for them. It's about getting them into the forefront because of the disadvantage that we are in when it comes to the social landscape. They don't have the funds to even get an ad. They don't have the funds to do anything other than go door to door. And so if we were able to be pragmatic and get them to a position over the course of four years, again, after the voting polls close of this upcoming election in 2024, then we can end up in a place where we have more progressive candidates, candidates that are more radical, it can act in our best interest. And I personally believe that our best interest as young people, because we are a more progressive generation, just I guess based off of, um, of, of trends, this will in turn elevate the world in general. Because if we have a more progressive world, more people benefit. If more people benefit, then we have more hospitality. We have a better world. We are in a place where we can exercise goodwill in full. And in terms of my paper, I, there were points in times where I did address issues that were more pertinent to my community, because as you heard in my intro, I fight for my people. And so in doing so, focusing on the issues that are pertinent to my community are also the ones that, if solved, will benefit the large community as well. Because, for example, if the black economy is elevated, per se, right, then the nascent economy is elevated as well because we live in this nation. It's simple philosophy. And furthermore, excuse me, your third question, did I fully address it? Yes, okay. Did I address all parts of your question? Right, okay. So I'll believe that that comes to education, mostly, in terms of widespread education, because as we have seen, there are certain people in power are trying to prevent education from being fully received, whether it's critical race theory or whether it's just simple history. If we were able to let our youth know, those that are even younger than us in my generation know what 
the certain issues and problems that plague this nation are and prevent them from achieving their best, then there is much that can be understood and then much that can be accomplished because they're coming from the perspective of, okay, this is what I face and this is what we can do to maneuver it. And that relates to racism as well. You should learn about what you can do in order to change the system for the better. Then you advance and you progress. I would also love to answer that question. Just the last one. Um, I think for the most part, all ages face the issue of access when it comes to voting. So I feel like expanding that access, as you were saying, education, but I think just also meeting people where they are um, and just kind of like speaking their language and not coming and talking like, like speaking what they want to hear and then also showing them the evidence, like showing them the history where voting has changed, like the world around you. So I think just making sure they see, not only they need to see that voting makes a difference, but then that's gonna push them to want to do more. And then what we're supposed to do is increase the access. So when they are pushed to that point, they should be able to access it. They should not be running around circles. Like they should not be suffering just to get to the voting polls. Like there should be areas where they're able to go and vote and vote easily. So voting should be a normal part of like their, like I guess like their yearly process. Like they should be thinking about, okay, like, you know exactly where I need to go to figure out where the polls are, what the times are, and sometimes I feel like, specifically for state and local um, governments, this is really like where they shine, and they should be able to promote their own like election and things that are going on because that's really where, I guess like if you're in a community, that's the most impact you're going to feel through the people who are like leading that community. So I think with the federal election, even though we're talking big, I feel like. It's good for people to vote in a federal election, but I think it really, the change that they want to see starts in their own community. Dr. Grant has a question. Hi. Uh, I wanted to, on behalf of the Department of Political Science, here with my colleague, Dr. Middlemass, congratulate you all on this wonderful uh, work that you have done. Congratulations to Westland. <laughs> And to Ellison, I have the pleasure of having both Ellison and Alon in my class, and so I'm happy that everybody gets to see their fabulousness. Um, we have to go for a meeting in the department, but again, wanted to congratulate you on behalf of the department and just say how proud we are of the work that you've done. We can't wait to see what's coming next as you continue to read more and encourage you to be in conversation with older folks who have been in this struggle for a long time and might be able to tell you a little bit about how you can strengthen your arguments and strengthen your plans in ways that help you avoid some of the pitfalls that we have all fallen into along the way. So again, congratulations, and we are proud of you. Thank you for coming, both of you. Yes, so um, I have a question. Um, any of the panelists can answer this. Um, currently, I'm in um, Dr. Um, Grant's class, um, Black Migrations and Politics in America. Um, I also take her problems in American democracy class. But um, learning about what is, um, learning about black migration, um, we see that in the South that um, there's a Republican monopoly going on across every state legislator. Um, and, and you know that they control the um, redistricting of each state. So how do we mobilize voters who feel like their vote is still disenfranchised even going into this election? How do we mobilize voters um, with the Republican state legislators that are constantly making new districts but making it where it's a black majority district and we're, losing, we're starting to lose seats not only in the House but also in the state legislators? How do we, what is the solutions, um, or not even say solutions, but from your work, what do you think would be some of the answers to these problems? Um, I would just say engagement. I think that's the most important thing, like making sure that people are able to be engaged and have that ability to like engage with other people who are like-minded. So I feel like even with me and Elson, like I've learned so much from him, he's learned so much from me. So I feel like 
that is just like a testament of like what relationships can build to like building that network and like staying a step ahead of them like because they're going to do it and like especially in the south like we know they're going to do it and i think um, Miss Abrams is a good example of that. Like she knew that's like that's their plan, and she stayed ahead of that plan. And then that's how she was able to mobilize like the black community in Georgia. So I think like making sure that you're like kind of just anticipating that. Like after you've learned about it, like just anticipate like those are the type of things that they're going to use to make sure that you're disenfranchised. So like assuming disenfranchisement and then working around it, like providing transportation, making sure that like older people like are able to use their vote, even though like they might like not go outside all the time, like being able to, making sure that they're able to still like engage and be a part of the process. And then just connecting with people who are not your age group, like making sure that you're fostering those connections. Cause I feel like we can mobilize as young people, but it's like, we're still nothing without like the older generation or the older generation is still nothing without us. So make sure that we're still facilitating like an exchange of like ideas and values across that spectrum is good. Yeah, I echo that sentiment in full, but I also want to emphasize the importance of pointing to the situations in which that mobilization has worked. Because if we're able to point to specific situations in history where our efforts or the past generation's efforts have been successful, and I believe that I can motivate many people to, sh to see, wow, maybe I can do it. Maybe we can do it once we come together. Maybe we can accomplish something, and then more people accomplish more. And that can erase that issue. That's my perspective. Thank you. Thank you all very much for your wonderful presentations. I have a question that you kind of, can, oh, <laughs> my, name, my name is Cassandra Vini. I am the executive director for the Center for Women, Gender, and Global Leadership, and I am a political scientist by training. So my question sort of piggybacks on your question, and I hope goes to some comments that you made as well. And I'll try to make this as brief as possible. We know that the South in particular is changing demographically. We've got this migration, the reverse migration in terms of a whole lot of African Americans who are in Chicago, Detroit, and whatnot have moved to the South. On top of that, it's becoming browner and blacker, if you will, as a result of African migration, Caribbean migration, uh, Central American migration. So how do we really get the public, I'm not saying the public doesn't understand, but I'm convinced it doesn't know it necessarily, that the South, even though those state legislatures are doing all kinds of gerrymandering, that the South is demographically changing and will continue to change. So it goes back to how do we highlight international migration and domestic internal migration, and how do we not just recognize that, but how do we mobilize? these various communities to build coalitions where maybe we could do something about uh, redistricting, what, redistricting, because you've got to get, I agree with you 100%, in terms of state and local elections. It's those state legislatures, as we know. How do we get more of us into those state legislatures? And in the absence of that, until we do that, again, how do we go about the business of building coalitions that reflect the demographic changes in the South in particular. Thank you. Um, I'll just, um, just give an example of this. So like, as I was saying previously, I am first gen. So my mom is from um, Liberia and she received like her citizenship and I was like, I think like 18 or 17. So like, I was able to see like her first voting experience and see like how she was like engaged because like the person in our community who was running was also Liberian American. So I think like making sure that the person that's in or like that we're mobilizing for also has her issues in mind. Like even if it was a situation where it was like, let's say like an African American or someone else who also like knew that she was a part of the community, like making sure that she's also like taken, I guess, account for that made her feel like she was a part of the process. So I think, especially as you're saying, like there's a lot of different um, areas of the diaspora that are going to the South and like making sure that when we are doing these elections, when we are finding people who are going to lead and be the next, um, you know, like state senator, make sure that they understand that there's a part of their society that they might not be tapping into. Like there's, you know, there might be black Caribbeans and like maybe they don't feel like anything on the ballot relates to them. 
So just making sure that we're also like being, I guess like well-rounded when we look at black communities and spe specifically for me, I try to do that because I am first gen, so I do have that experience. Okay, I can answer that question too. From the perspective of debates, because one thing I have found when it comes to certain discussions is that the best way to really analyze where to go is to understand where you guys all agree. And so if all the people across the diaspora, are, or not all the people of course, but in these coalitions are able to come together prior to running for a position or prior to voting, are able to sit down and see, okay, what are the issues that we all face are similar and can be tackled? If we're able to do that and really understand the inner workings of each other, the inner workings of the issues that really perturb our communities, and then from then on, excuse me, politicians run that are not just descriptive, but also substantive in how they represent us, then can these local elections truly be representative of us and truly address the issues that once again are causing such fracturing in our communities? I have a comment. It's hard for me to sit here and not say anything. Uh, when I was a student, the students at Howard University were out there demonstrating. They were very actively involved. And when we started putting together this uh, competition, I thought that this might help to encourage more engagement from the Howard students, especially if they had some brilliant Howard students talking to them and writing about them. I would like to know how do we get the students at Howard and at other HBCUs more engaged uh, and then, you know, what can the administration, the staff, and the professors do to help this along? I was telling somebody the other day, during the pandemic, we would have these calls with some members of the HUSA and other universities, along with the, the president of Tennessee State University. She used to come on most of the calls. And we talked about helping getting students to help to get people out to vote during the pandemic. And one of the things that Rachel Howe, who was the president of Houston at that time, she now works at the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. One of the things we talked about was having the university administration declare election day as a day of service. And if it would start with the HBCUs, the PWIs probably would follow. And then you would have this day of service throughout the country and eventually maybe we'd make election day a day off so that people who work in positions where they cannot get the day off, they wouldn't have to be trying to struggle to get to the polls before or after work. The other thing I was talking with the president of Clark Atlanta University and I was very excited to hear that he now requires every incoming freshman who is old enough to have their voter registration at the time they register for college. And so that's another. So maybe if you all could put together some ideas and, and uh, present it to the administration and other students, are there some things that you think that we can do? You know, it's not too late for November, but there are some students here who don't know how to vote. I know on election day, we run a command center. I've had students come in with their absentee ballots on election day, thinking that they can give them to me and I can get them to their state. I've had other students wanting to register to vote. And I know you all, some of the student groups have had voter registration, but they used to, when I first came to Howard, every Friday was voter registration day and they could tell you what your state requirement was and how you can get registered. So I'd just like to hear you all weigh in on how can we Maybe this year, you all are graduating. No, you are still junior. Uh, how, can, how can we mobilize Howard University and other HBCUs to be examples of voter engagement for uh, young people? Well, I would say in terms of student engagement, I believe that the largest orgs on the campus, on Howard's, camp, Howard's campus, we call it the Yard Runners, but if the largest organizations on this campus are able to come together, again, I'm a man of unity, are able to come together and truly speak about the importance of voting, as well as the different avenues in which you can go vote. And not just that, but set out certain pipelines even, whether it's through transportation or through mailing voting, mailing ballots in or so on and so forth. If these are set up and solidified, then our 
I guess, what is it, the makeup? The makeup of voters from our generation, and not just that, but from administration as well, from those, anybody who is unable to truly partake in voting, if that is solidified, then HBCUs can be a beacon of hope for voting in this nation. Um, to your point, just about like people like potentially like missing school, missing work, I think it's really important that the university understands like in order to do something, especially like voting, I feel like people might find like excuses. So I think it's important to mitigate that risk and like being like, okay, like as you said, like you don't have any classes for today, like you should be voting. So I think like not giving people like an alternate alternative to like do and just being like, okay, this is voting day, recognizing it as voting day, and then also like allowing them to understand like if they are, because I know for me personally, like being at school and like like voting in Minnesota, it's like, how do I do that process? So I think like making sure that they understand it's very possible and it's very um, convenient for you to do a mail-in ballot and showing them exactly how to do it and then showing them which states, like, cause I know some states might not allow that and just having like, kind of like a, cause I feel like we use a lot of social media. So it's like digital communications is more important than me, to me than like maybe like going on the yard and being like, okay, X, Y, Z and go and vote. Cause you're gonna reach more people. You're gonna reach students who might like not be on campus that day. Like if you have like a flyer, it's kind of like this is exactly how you vote this by state, and then showing them like the ability to just do it right from their phone. Because I feel like our generation is all about convenience. We like it to be easy. We like it to be like quick. So like showing them how quick that process can be, even just to register, is going to be key. Are there any last minute questions that anybody has, or we are going to go ahead and start closing out? Um, uh, you in the back, I haven't heard from you yet, so go ahead. Hi, thank you all for having this today and sharing your knowledge with us and your insights. My name is Kennedy Evers. I am a political si junior political science major, and I am a news and politics reporter for The Hilltop. And my question for you all today is, as we know and see on social media and just talking to our peers, a lot of us can be apprehensive when it comes to voting as well as disinterested and discouraged. So what is some words of advice or encouragement that you could give to our generation and the people in our communities when it comes to voting and just really emphasizing that their voices do matter and their vote matters as well. If I can address the generation at the very least, are not really persuaded by fear of what could happen if you don't vote. It's been shown that apathy, at least in my generation, again, does not really subside when it comes to people being told that if you don't do this, then the world is going to end, for example, while I'm being hyperbolic. Was it Trump running for president of the United States? Yes. No, I understand. Trust me. I know it can be quite confusing. I understand that. But this is the fact of the matter. People on generation, sadly, and I'm not saying this is me. This is just a generalization of the fact that fear is not what works. And so what I'll propose is use something different. Use fun, as we just prescribed earlier. Talk about how your organization that you want to join or are a part of are voting. Make it cool. Make it something that they can actually relate to. And then at the same time, you can in infuse the importance of voting simultaneously if you talk about that fun, but also emphasize how your vote has power, how your vote has a purpose, how you have a meaning when you participate in your electoral elections, both local, state, and federal. Then you get young people out there voting for progressive candidates for Joseph Biden? Um, I think for me, I think it's just about like attaching voter, like attaching like the political spirit to like people's passions. So I feel like most people at Howard at least are like very passionate about their own communities. Like they're passionate about where they come from. And I feel like once they understand and connect that voting is like a direct, like it's a direct application to where you come from. Like that's gonna exactly affect like what's going on there. So like participating is like you, like I guess um, kind of furthering that passion, like you making sure that you're protecting your community, like that's a part of voting. So I think like, as you were saying, some people aren't motivated by fear, but I think people are motivated by like, I think when it comes to fear, they're motivated by fear when they believe it impacts them. But it's like, if it's just fear of like, oh, okay, that's happening over there, like that has nothing to do with me. I feel like our generation is very, they have the attitude where it's like, if it's over there, like that's, it just, it's a non-factor. 
So making sure that they understand that voting is a factor. Like that's a factor in your life and it's gonna affect you. Maybe it might not affect you right now, but like you never know, you can move to a place where you might not have abortion access. Like you, you never know. And I feel like understanding that our entire like state as a country is like interconnected. So like if this, if something happens in a specific state, that's how it led to Roe v. Wade being turned over. So it's like seeing the interconnectivity of like everything that's going on is gonna be critical for people to understand, especially on campus, like when you're in college, you just have so many different like things you're focused on, but understanding that you're also a part of the outside world community and that the US literally could be going down a direction that you don't want it to be. And if you don't like act now, then you're a part of aiding that process. Thank you so much for participating in the question and answer. These kind of discussions are what's going to foster a voting spirit and get out, get everybody out in the 2024 election cycle. I'll now pass it over to Dr. Scott. Give a round of applause to our students. Thank you so much. I had a chance to spend some time with them last week in Los Angeles in between sessions at the conference. So I really was happy I got a chance to get to know them. And, and uh, Ellison even came to, and they did an oral history. I was one of the black political scientists selected by the American Political Science Association to do an oral history of my background. And he even came to that, so he knows more about me than most people in this room now. <laughs> uh, so at this time, I want to recognize the Kimler family. Uh, what did uh, Stace Abrams call you all? <laughs> the quad. Uh, Jamie and Paula Kimler, I met them about eight years ago, maybe. And we formed a bond uh, because I was impressed with the fact that their father had taught here at Howard University in the political science department. And they were children, both of the Kimler brothers, but three and one or something like that when their father died. And they wanted to seek out Howard University and see how they could give back in their father's legacy. And so they've been with us ever since. Uh, the first round of money ran out they came back with more. So I just want to really want to thank you all for being a part of Howard University now. Thank you very much. Would Jamie or Tom, would either of you or both of you want to give a few brief comments? They're the ones who provided the funds for these students to go to the, to the National Conference of Black Political Scientists. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Scott. So this is going to be very, very brief, but uh, so um, my father, Edgar Kemmler, came to Howard as an instructor in government in 1957, so that was 67 years ago. And as, as was said, uh, we didn't really get a chance to know him, but the archives at Howard were very kind to share some of the correspondence that he had with the Dean of Liberal Arts, and this was Frank Snowden, Jr., so I don't know if you know the name, but... Um, in any event, um, and that to my father, he was very proud to be associated with Howard. And I have to say it's the same for us and for the whole Kemmler family. So, um, and just one final thought, um, Paul and I now have a six month old grandson. So I guess that's generation alpha, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we, we think a lot about what kind of future he's gonna have. And I have to say today, I'm very optimistic because I think the leadership of this country and of the world is really gonna rest with people like yourselves coming from Howard and, and that makes me feel more optimistic. So thank you very much, it was very impressive. Thank you. And I look forward to the continuing relationship with the family. Now, it is my pleasure to bring forth Mrs. Walters, Ms. Patricia Walters, who comes every year, who has been supportive of the center. She, she's the reason why we have the center. And when I was in, uh, Mrs. Walters, you might want to know, when I was at, in LA at the National Conference of Black Political Scientists, Dr. Walters, what they say his favorite student, Robert Smith, died last year. Right. 
but they, we memorialized him this year at the conference. And his wife came from San Francisco, and I got a chance to uh, speak with her. But it was Robert Smith, Mrs. Walters, uh, Ms., uh, <laughs> why am I drawing a blank on your That's name? Okay, I do uh, Dr. Walters' uh, brother. Kevin. Thank you so much. Kevin, they, we, we pulled together after Mrs. Walters had gotten the Board of Trustees to create a Ron Walters Center. It was just sitting there doing nothing. But Mrs. Walters got on the phone telling people, you know, you're going to make the center in my, my husband's name. And then she recruited me to come over here to leave my job and come here. Yes, I did. But uh, I loved her husband. I knew him from when I was a student. And so she's always here. So the mic is yours, Mrs. Walters. Thank you. First of all, I want to acknowledge Kevin. He was Ron's uh, youngest brother. And um, he has been my right-hand man in terms of my thought processes, in terms of the center, and in terms of the inaugural chair with Stacy, I, um, I, I, I approach him all the time. So he's my other half. And I think that he probably understood Ron almost as much as me, but not quite. Um, but we can bounce ideas off of each other. So I truly want to acknowledge you, Kevin. And, and to let you know how much I adore you and love you. And I'd like to say one other thing. When Ron took me home to meet his family in Wichita, Kansas, Kevin was only about maybe three or four years of age. And he found out that I love to play Scrabble. So I said, oh, I'm going to knock this kid out. So we sat and played Scrabble, and he murdered me. <laughs> and I never quite got over that because yeah. I, knew, I always beat Ron, but you can beat a true intellectual because they think of big names. And in Scrabble, it's the little words that count. So he, I shared his story with everybody, but this is the first time I've shared it with a Howard audience. The Kempler family. I feel like they're my family now. That's truly the way I feel. Uh, they have been so committed to the Walter Center, to their dad's legacy here at Howard, and through that legacy, to be able to bring us young people like these two. Without them, we wouldn't have been able to have had them in terms of the kinds of things that they have done. And people at Howard know how accomplished they are. But it's incumbent upon us, and now incumbent upon me, to talk about them when I'm out on the road talking about Howard University. I have to bring their names up and say what they're doing to, um, and it gives me faith that um, the young people understand how important elections are. And I am so glad that this young man talked about elections at the school board level, at the state level, where you live, because that is very important, as we have learned, because that's where the nightmares are occurring with wanting to do away with um, African American history. That's basically the bottom line. They want to do away with it. And um, we have to be forward with our students and with their circle of friends to be able to say, uh uh. This isn't going to happen without a, a, a constant struggle, because this is what our great-grandfathers and great-grandmothers fought for. And this is our legacy. And you cannot take this le legacy and destroy it. I want to say to Elsie, she's right. I stowed her from the Congressional Black Caucus. And um, I knew that she knew my husband. And I understood that she would be the perfect person to get this program started. And I knew I, I was very fortunate because I had a wonderful relationship with um, President Rabot, with President Frederick, and evolving with Vinson, President Vinson. And so you have to have access to that level to achieve what it is that you want 
for Ron's endowed chair and particularly for the center. And so um, I'm a very talkative person, so I think I'm going to stop it there. But just to say that I thank the young people for coming out. And um, I hope that some of you will be able to come tomorrow when Stacy does her presentation with the Hilltop and also talking about how important journalism is. And I just want to say to you, young man, it, I wasn't being a negative force when I talked about uh, how important this election is. When I travel the country and I talk to young people, I say exactly what your, your paper said. I said, this is an election that you have to contemplate the lesser of the two evils. But I'm coming from a different perspective than you. I'm coming from, we can't have another, we can't have Trump in another four years. We won't have a country. I had to end up moving to Africa or to Canada, and I don't really want to do that. Um, I'm 85 years old. I should be able to stay in my own home. I should be able to not worry about going down the street and being called the N-word and having people cuss me out in the grocery store line because they just feel like they're empowered. All right, you all? They feel empowered now to humiliate you. And I'm a feisty soul. So, and, and, and my niece from Bermuda there, Selena, she keeps saying, Auntie, you can't act like that now because these people are kind of crazy and you don't know if they will attack you. And, but sometimes I can't restrain myself. And so with that, I'm going to end. I'm just so uh, admiring of my young lady from Columbus. We'll have to talk afterwards. Um, and the two people that uh, got the award. And I'm terrible with names, always have been, so I won't remember. But um, once I do a, a, a presentation out on the road and say your names, then it'll be etched in my mind. And I just think this was an outstanding presentation, uh, Elsie. And uh, I thank everyone for coming. I thought, yeah, Kevin. as other institutions may be uh, tied into it, but I'm just thinking, I mean, the way these kids use social media, uh, there's no reason for it not to be Zoom, TikTok, and all that. You talk about uh, bringing a grassroots level of organization and people together, you could do that easily across campuses by simply using the tools you use every day. And I don't know if that's in use, so I may be speaking out of turn. I just wanted yeah. to ask. Well, that. Billy has been doing you want to tell what you've been doing? I, um, I, do, I do the social media for the Ronald Vernon Center that um, your husband's for, so I do. So are these shared over social media? Yes. Mm -hmm. it's the flyer, Sue, and right Elon now. also works. Mm -hmm. okay. and so people can link to this and see it? Right. We, we, have, a YouTube, we have a YouTube channel, okay. and okay. that's where you see all this equipment here. We have uh, hired technicians so that it will be shown and so that their parents can see them back in their hometown. So that's advertised? We, we didn't get the, the link for the YouTube up till today. But uh, Wes, uh, Weslin has done a great job on LinkedIn. I mean, she's all over LinkedIn. And I think some of her friends are here because of that. But uh, we... That, that's been sort of a weak link at, at, at the center because we have to hire young people that's able to do the Instagram because I do Facebook and they don't do Facebook anymore. They don't do Twitter anymore. So I'm behind this happenings, but I am on LinkedIn and we are friends on LinkedIn. So. Yeah. Howard University. 
Ron taught here, you all know, for 25 years before he went over to the University of Maryland. And he left because of swagger. And I don't have a problem saying that. And when I write the book, I'll tell the true story about why Ron left Howard. It wasn't for the money. He could have gone to Dartmouth, he could have gone to Harvard, he could have gone to Yale, he could have gone any place in the country. But what I want to say about Kevin is that Kevin came to Howard for his undergraduate work because of Ron. And we were so excited because that was another generation coming to Howard, right? And then if that wasn't good enough, his daughter came to Howard and she graduated. And um, what's the thing? What's the, physician assistant. And then one of the presidents, I think it was Swiger, did away with it, but now it's back. And um, she's a, a practitioner, and she gives medicine, and she's a good spokesperson for Howard University. So the point I'm making is that gener her, your brother got his master's degree here, uh, Dwayne. So our family follows Ron and education. And so this the Walters legacy continues through families. I have no doubt that when they have a grandchild that they will come to Howard. And now I'm going to truly shut up everybody. Okay, we have refreshments outside and you can continue to communicate with each other. But one thing, I, last thing I have to do, I have a gift for Elon for all the work she's done and she's in my office looking at my books and I had Ron's biography there, and she said she wanted that. So I got a copy of Ron Thanks, everybody, for coming. And be sure to take some of the food, because I know we have, we order more than enough if it's out there. Thank you.